Our Lord said, where there are two or more gathered together, I am there with them. And he's in us too, so we can't ask for more than that. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we dedicate the next few moments to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. This goes along with our study of Galatians. And after we go over Hebrews 10... We'll go to Galatians 3.18, so you might want to tab that as well. Hebrews 10.1, and then we'll go to Galatians 3.18, all of which talking about the same subject, the purpose of the law. What's the purpose of the law? And we've noted how there was Abraham and the promise of Abraham, faith alone and Christ alone. So why in the world did the law come along? Well, Hebrews 10.1 explains some of these things. Hebrews 10, 1, for the law, possessing a shadow of the good things to come. And they have the song, me and my shadow. Well, what does a shadow do? It points to you. And it can either follow you or be in front of you, but it's a shadow and it always points in one direction. So for the law, possessing, possessing a shadow of good things to come but not the reality itself is therefore completely unable by the same sacrifices offered continually year after year to perfect those who come to worship. The law has no ability to bring one to perfection or salvation is what it means. Now in 10.2 For otherwise would they not have ceased being offered since the worshipers would not since the worshipers would have been purified once and for all and so have no further consciousness of sin in other words why did they keep on offering these offerings and if it were if the law were a means and if these sacrifices were a means of salvation why didn't they just uh, sacrifice once once and for all just as we believe once and for all answer this was a teaching tool to teach them as a shadow of what is to come so then in 10:3, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year after year 10:4, and remember the law was made as a fence as it were to know that we've been transgressing and we do all the time 10:4. For the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. This is what the Mosaic Law offered. Shadow Christology. And they would shed the blood of bulls and goats, goats without spot and without blemish, in order to teach a message that Jesus Christ would come. Now in 10.5. So when he, Jesus Christ, came into the world, that is through physical birth, he said, this is our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is what he said in deity. He did not say this in his humanity. He said it in deity. Now the Lord in the, in the manger, as we know it, but in the feeding trough, our Lord in the feeding trough did say these things. But he said it from his deity. No baby has the ability to talk, but Jesus Christ is so unique. From his deity, he actually did talk. And this is what he said in the feeding trough. A baby in the feeding trough said this. And he didn't have a baby, uh, well, he didn't even sound like a baby. He sounded like a full-grown man when he said it. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Whole burnt offerings and sin offerings you took no delight in. And that is the Israelites at that time under the law 
they would go through these uh, sacrifices and these rituals, but God took no delight in it. It was a teaching tool to teach them of the coming of our Lord. 10.7 Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will. And, his, and God's will is so that our Lord Jesus Christ would provide eternal security. To do your will, O God. Then in 10.8 when he says above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor did you take delight in them, which are offered according to the law, 10.9, then he says, here I am, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first, what is the first, the Mosaic law? He does away with the first, Mosaic law, to establish the second. You know what that means for us? That means the Mosaic law has been done away with. Then he says, here I am, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first, the Mosaic law, to establish the second, 1010. By his will, we have been set apart. Made holy means to be set apart. We have been set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, the physical body of Jesus Christ, once and for all. Now notice the weakness of the Mosaic Law. They would go through this repetition over and over again. And it was part of a teaching tool. And they would make sacrifices and offerings over and over again. But guess what? We've been set apart by the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That means we believe in Christ, we're saved. And we're saved the same way they were in the Old Testament. And the law came along as a teacher. You know, if you go to... I, I've known some people who've gone to Catholic schools. And you know what the nuns... The nuns are pretty harsh. They're teachers. And you know what they do? If you start talking and you have your hand out like this, they take that ruler and smack right on your hand. Listen up, buddy, is what they would do. And they're very tough. And they are teachers. And that's all the law can do for us is teach us, curse us, smack us. And the law brings us around knowing we're transgressors. And that's the purpose of the law and the purpose of our Lord is so that we can have faith alone in Christ alone and be freed from all of that. So now let's look at Galatians 3.18. Galatians 3.18. I had a teacher in middle school I forget his name. I should remember his name because he was very flamboyant. He almost seemed kind of gay, but anyway, he was very flamboyant, and he would walk around with this ruler. And if somebody were talking, he would smack, or not paying attention, even if somebody were sleeping, he would take this yardstick, and it was a yardstick, and he would smack it on the desk to get their attention. Now, he never would hit him on the hand. That's not acceptable, of course. But one day, he just, you know, he just get fired up, smack on the desk. One day, somebody's hand was out there, and he missed the desk and hit the hand. And that, that, that boy cried, <laughs> and that teacher was scared. <laughs> he said, I'm so sorry, so sorry, and kept going and going. He could have gotten in trouble. I don't think he did, though. But that's the law. It, it spanks us. It, it, it brings us to a realization we need a Savior. Galatians 3.18 For if the inheritance is based on the law, no longer based on the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by means of the promise. And, you know, when God makes a promise, he doesn't renege on it. When people make promises, they renege all the time. But God is righteous. He never reneges on a promise. And the promise to Abraham was Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. So the promise was Abraham had eternal life based on faith alone in Christ alone. We have eternal life based on faith alone in Christ alone. We have eternal life based on the promise. And Galatians 3.18 says, For if the inheritance is based on the law, it's no longer based on the promise. And that's important because if we start working for salvation, then we don't believe the promise, and that's blasphemy. Again, Galatians 3.18, 
For if the inheritance is based on the law, it's not. For if the inheritance is based on the law, no longer based on the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by means of the promise. And the promise given to Abraham is the same promise given to us. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And now people try to follow the law. Today, not so much. Some people today still try to follow the law. The Jews do, and even certain sects of so-called Christianity do. But uh, most of them follow parts of the law and then lots of taboos. And if it's based on the law and if it's based on taboos, you don't believe the promise. And the promise is faith alone in Christ alone. And I would say probably most believers don't believe the promise. And you ask some believers, do you believe in eternal security? Some may say yes, but then if you say, well, let's say you blow your head off, do you believe in eternal security? And they'll probably think about that and say, I don't know. I don't know if you're saved if you blow your brains out. I just can't, I just can't imagine that. Or if you, they might claim to believe in eternal security, but if you ask them, well, what if I believe in Christ, but then 10 years later I decide to reject him? Are you saved? And they will probably say, no, you're not. But you are, and that's given in 1 Timothy. So that means God will not renege on his promise. If you believed in Christ, you have the promise, period. No matter what you do, it's not based on what you do anyway. That's human arrogance inserting itself into the plan of God, and there's no, uh, there's no basis for that. Galatians 3.19 now, in Galatians 3.19 and following, the Apostle Paul is going to give four reasons why the Mosaic Law is inferior to grace. He's going to give four reasons why the Mosaic Law is inferior to the law of grace. And he's going to ask a question that we're all going to get answered today. What was the purpose of the law, the Mosaic Law? Then he goes on, it was added for the sake of transgressions. In fact, it was added for the sake of mankind being able to recognize his transgressions. As we noted yesterday, the reason why people build fences around their property is that someone will know if they transgress, they'll know they're transgressing because they'll have to get through a fence to do it. So the Mosaic Law is, as it were, a fence to let us know we're transgressing the law. And we all have. So what was the purpose of the Mosaic Law? It was added for the sake of transgressions. Then we have the word ordained. The word ordained means it makes precise arrangements. Ordained through the instrumentality of angels is actually how it comes out in the Greek. Ordained through the instrumentality of the angels or by agency of the angels in the hand of the mediator until the arrival of the descendant to whom the promise was made. So reason one is given in 319. Reason one why the Mosaic Law is inferior to the law of grace is that it's temporary. It's transitory. The reason why the Mosaic Law is inferior to the law of grace is that it's, trans it's a transient. It's temporary. It was added at the time of Moses and it was abrogated by the cross. Again, the law was added at the time of Moses and abrogated by the cross. Now, what we must note is that which is temporary is inferior to that which is permanent. The promise to Abraham is permanent. What was the promise to Abraham? Faith alone in Christ alone. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. That's permanent. And so the Abrahamic covenant in itself, in all, of its, uh, in all of its nuances, the Abrahamic covenant is permanent. The, Mo the Mosaic law is not permanent, and therefore it is inferior. The Abrahamic covenant is temporary and abrogated by the cross. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, therefore we don't have to. And remember, the only thing the law can do for us is put a curse on us. And it's been that way from the beginning that it was created during the time of Moses. Now in Galatians 3.20. Now, what we're going to... I'm, I'm just going to go straight from the pure Greek. One day I'm going to bring my Greek Bible so you can look at it yourself. It's quite interesting. 
uh, you won't understand it, but they, you'll, you'll see where I'm coming from. Now, a mediator is not one, is not of one. This is actually straight from the Greek, and the Greek does this. You have some additions in your word, in your Bible, to try to help you understand it, but sometimes when they try to help the word of God, they really mess up. Now, a mediator is not of one. God is of one. And that's how Paul says it. And they understood it because they understood the elliptical nature of their language. Now, a mediator is not of one. And this is a genitive of description from the Greek. A mediator is not of one. God is of one. And that means that God is one in essence. So we must understand what this verse is saying in terms of mediatorship. A mediator stands between party of the first part and party of the second part. Well, let's get a definition of a mediator. A mediator stands between party of the first part and party of the second part. And what it's saying here is between us and God, there's a wall. We have party of the uh, first part, mankind. We have party of the second part, God. And there's a wall between us. And because there's a wall, we need a mediator. And the law is not a mediator, and this is what the verse is saying. Because the difficulty with the law is that the angels stood between God and Israel. The angels stood between God and Israel. We noted that from Galatians 3.19. Ordained through the instrumentality of angels. The law was ordained through the angels in the hand of a mediator until the arrival of the descendant. So the angels were acting as a mediator, but they're an imperfect mediator. And why are they an imperfect mediator? Because angels are not man and angels are not God. You might have a trouble understanding it right now, but let me put it this way. Jesus Christ was the God-man. Jesus Christ in hypostatic union is both God and man. That makes Jesus Christ a perfect mediator. But with the Mosaic law, what was it? You had God, angels, and man. No Jesus Christ. In the giving of the Mosaic law, God, angels, and man. And the angels are an imperfect mediator because an angel's not a man and an angel's not God. So how can they be a good mediator? They're not. So that makes the law inferior. So Paul, the Apostle Paul is saying, reason two why there is a deficiency in the Mosaic law. Reason number two, the law has an inferior mediator, angels. And again, the last part of 319 talks about the angels being part of the mediator. But a mediator in 320, a mediator is not of one. God is of one. That is, God is one in essence. 1 Timothy 2.5 explains it and explains this further. Turn to 1 Tim Timothy 2.5. It's a short verse, but we need to look at it in relation to mediatorship. And what Paul is saying is that reason number two, the law is an inferior mediator. Reason number one, the law is temporary. Why is the law inferior? Reason number one, the law is temporary. Reason number two, the law has an inferior mediator. And now in 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. And then what does it say? The man, Christ Jesus. Well, it's making it clear that Jesus Christ is humanity. Jesus Christ also is God and deity. We saw that in Hebrews 10.1, where from the feeding trough, our Lord Jesus Christ said, Here I am, I have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book, I will do your will, O God. And that was Jesus Christ from his deity in the feeding trough. So the law is an inferior mediator. The true mediator is Jesus Christ. So the law could never cut it in the human race because the law is imperfect. And the law is imperfect in the sense that it is weak through the old sin nature. Now the fact that the law is from God, well that in itself makes it perfect. And you might say, that's blasphemy. You say the law is imperfect, it's from God. Yes, the law is from God. But it's imperfect in a sense 
and it, it, is, it is imperfect in a sense that it is weak through the old sin nature, and the Bible confirms that. Look at Romans 8, 3. This shows the weakness of the law. Romans 8, 3. Now, it was created by God for a purpose, and it was, the law was created by God, and, but it was created to be transitory and not permanent. Romans 8, 3. Again, the law can never cut it in the human race because the law is imperfect in the sense that it's weak through the old sin nature. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man. So what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. None of us can follow the law perfectly. And remember from James chapter uh, 10 2, I believe we studied yesterday, from James uh, 10 2 it says, anyone who uh, uh, transgresses one part of the law has transgressed all of it. So if you mess up on one point of the law, you might as well have not followed any part of the law. Once you transgress in one point, you're accursed. We also study that from Deuteronomy. So this shows the weakness of the law. So when you work under the power of the law, you become stupid. And that's why the Apostle Paul is so tough on the Galatians. They decided to go to the law and the power of the law, and that's ridiculous. It's as stupid as being a Flintstone today. You know what the Flintstones did? They cut uh, holes in the uh, bottom of their floor of the cars that they drove. You've watched the Flintstones, and they run with their feet, and they push the car with their feet. And when you go in for the Mosaic Law, you're trying to drive a car by pushing it with your feet. But when you go in for grace and understand Jesus Christ did all the work and fulfilled the law, only thing you do is push a gas pedal and all the powers provided. So when you go in for the Mosaic Law, you're as dumb as a Flintstone. So we have grace, and under grace the power is provided. And once you step on that gas pedal in your car, the power is there. Unless your car's gone AWOL from grace. That is, there's something wrong with the car. That happens too. But in terms of the, what the analogy is, you don't do anything. The power's been provided. You believe in Christ, you name, and after you've believed in Christ, you name your sins to God, you're filled with the Spirit, you have the power of the spiritual life. Now let's look at Galatians 3.21. Galatians 3.21, and this is reason three. Galatians 3.21 gives us reason number three why the power is weaker than the first promise of faith alone in Christ alone. Galatians 3.21. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. Is the law then opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that was able to give life, now we have the if, but this if means but there isn't. For if a law had been given that was able to give life, but there isn't. See, the Greek language had four different ifs. And our language is more general and we don't think as deeply as the Greeks to be honest we say if 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 and sometimes we can uh, pull out the context and understand which if you're using but the Greek had four different areas of if if and it's true if and it's not true if and I wish it were true etc for if a law had been given that was able to give but there isn't then righteousness would certainly have come from the source of the law. So Paul's telling the Galatians, look, if you could have life through the law, I would have told you. But Paul never told them about the law. And that's because no life comes from the law. So reason number three why the law is inferior, the law cannot give life. Remember, the only thing the law can do is curse, as we've noted from Deuteronomy. If you don't do this, you're cursed. If you don't do that, you're cursed. 
also what makes the law inferior. It's, it is dependent upon man, and that is what makes the law so popular. It appeals to arrogance. And if you think about it, you'll understand the law appeals to arrogance in that if I, for example, the law says, and this is true and this carries over into the church age, if you obey your parents, you'll live a long and prosperous life promise. And, but it's conditional upon what, who and what you are and what you do. So you see how easy it is that from the distortion of the law, you can get very arrogant and self-righteous. And you could walk around with your nose up in the air. I've obeyed my parents. I am deserve and will receive prosperity and long life. And you will. But you see, it's dependent upon you. And if you turn it into arrogance, then you've uh, done away with the purpose of it. And that's what the Jews did with it. Now, Galatians 3.22. Galatians 3.22 gives reason for as to, the, as to why the law is inferior to grace. Galatians 3.22 But the scripture has concluded once and for all that the human race is under the control of sin for the purpose that a promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But the scripture has concluded and for all that... The, 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 but the, the scripture has concluded once and for all that the human race is under the control of the sin nature for the purpose that a promise by faith in Jesus Christ might once and for all be given to those who believe. There's a once and for all clause there in the Greek. So reason for the law is a jailer and not a savior. Jesus Christ has saved us and those who believe in Christ are saved. Those who follow the law are jailed. And, in you, and you will remember yesterday in our study of the rich young ruler that he chose jail rather than freedom. And he made the choice for jail when he walked away from our Lord Jesus Christ and hung his head low. He should have hung his head low, but he should have, he should have followed up with a question. He should have said, you know what, you're right, teacher. What must I do now to be saved? And then if he had showed any positive volition, our Lord would have said, believe in me. But he didn't show positive volition, and our Lord actually told him to believe in him by saying, follow me through regeneration. But our Lord said, follow me through regeneration after the man had left. The man left and went away sad because he finally realized he had not kept the entirety of the law. So the rich young ruler chose jail rather than freedom. So reason number, reason number four, the law is a jailer and not a savior. So again, we must look at the Mosaic Law for a moment. I'll let you out early on this beautiful Friday afternoon. You can thank me later. The recipients of the Mosaic Law. Again, the recipients of the Mosaic Law. First of all, the Mosaic Law was given to the nation of Israel, not to us. And this is where Christianity has gone astray and has been going astray from the beginning. The Mosaic Law was given to the nation of Israel and not to us. And you know, they, they started as soon as... All churches have done this from the beginning. The church in Jerusalem went in for the law. Right after our Lord Jesus Christ died as a substitute for them, immediately they went in for the law. Legalism is around everywhere because it's satanic. It's satanic and it's the devil's ace trump to get people away from spirituality and first of all, to get people away from the gospel. You must follow a religion, etc. And religion is an evil, vicious thing. All you have to do is look at uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and know that religion is vicious. And uh, I saw some stories last night about the man we blew up. He started out as a young man, and they always considered him a half-wit. wasn't very smart. And uh, they, didn't, they never thought he would make anything of himself, and he really didn't. But what happened was he was a normal young man. He loved sports, and he would go out and play soccer. That's their favorite sport in the Arab world and in most of the world. Here in America, it's football, and most of the other parts of the world, it's soccer. So he was like any other young man. He liked soccer. But then suddenly, he got led astray by religion. And when he got into religion, he went nuts. And he decided he was going to fight every infidel all across the world. 
First of all, he fought, he fought the Russians, which he thought were infidels. He was probably right, but he is too. And then he said, well, now I'm going to fight Americans. That's where he made his mistake. And now he's dead and burning in hell. But that just shows how vicious religion is. In his religion, he could just go around chopping off people's heads and justify it and say, I have a right to do it because God wants me to do it. And uh, it even comes down into Christian activism in which Christians go around blowing up abortion clinics. It hasn't happened lately, but that was a big thing in the 90s. Even Christians would go around and blow up an abortion clinic. Well, they've gone in for legalism. God, you can't justify that. You're murdering people. It's insanity. But that's the way religion goes. So the Mosaic Law was first given to the nation of Israel. The Mosaic Law, on the negative side, was never given to Gentiles. Deuteronomy 4.8, Romans 2.12-14 makes that clear. Mosaic Law was never given to Gentiles. And why would we want to follow it? We might as well turn to Deuteronomy 4.8 just so you can see it with your own eyes that it's not for us, it's for Jews or for Israel. It's not even for Jews anymore. It was for Israel only. Deuteronomy 4.8 And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? None. It wasn't given to Gentiles. It was given to Israel only. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? It was only given to Israel. But when you read how great it is, and when some of the Gentiles read how great it is, they said, well, maybe we should follow it too. But we're in a different age. And in fact, when it comes to divine establishment principle, this country follows a lot of the Mosaic Law in terms of divine establishment. And in that case, it does carry over into the church age, but that's a technical point. But the overriding point for us as believers is we're under a higher law. We're not under the Mosaic law. It was given to a specific nation, the nation of Israel. Also, Romans 2, 12 through 14 gives us a description of the fact that the law is given to Israel only. And I could show this to some people who disagree with me and my own family and I don't think they would get it or believe. They definitely wouldn't get it. And they probably definitely wouldn't believe it either. Romans 2.12. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. So you see in Romans 2.12 it gives a distinction. There are those apart from the law. That is those who are not Israelites. They're apart from the law. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. In, uh, in other words, you're cursed either way unless you believe in Christ is what Romans uh, 2.12 is saying. But in Romans 2.12 through 14 it's giving you a distinction between the fact that there are those under the law, Israelites, and there were those out from under the law, Gentiles. The law was given to Israel only. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. That is all of the law. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law... Who doesn't have the law? Gentiles. You're a Gentile more, more than likely. But even today, if you're a Jew and you've believed in Christ, you're not under the law. All of us look like Gentiles anyway. I'm pretty sure we all are. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. In other words, what this is saying is 
the law put up a fence and the Israelites could see more clearly when they were transgressing. It's as if there's two different cultures. There's the culture of the Jews who put up fences, the law, so that people would know when they transgressed. And then there's the Gentiles who never bothered putting up fences. But they would still know by nature when they had stolen something from someone else. Even though they weren't over the, under the law, they would still know by their very nature that they had transgressed. That they didn't need the law to even know they transgressed, although it was an aid. It did help people understand, just as a fence helps people understand you've transgressed. The law actually puts up a barrier in divine establishment. And in order to help you understand this a little better, and then we'll close, is the fact that in our culture lately, we let people get away with everything. We've clamped down on it, on it some much more than we used to, but uh, especially in the 80s, early 90s, we didn't clamp down on any type of crime whatsoever. And that's why that uh, young lady up in Clemson got killed. I forgot her name. But she was murdered by an animal who had been let out. Now, if we had had, if we had observed the Mosaic Law, and in this way we should have, in that it's establishment principle, we would have executed that man, and he would have never killed again, because he would have been executed. And so the Gentiles, as it were, were a bit more loose in their application of these things, just as our country is way too loose in their application of the law. And so, but that man still knows he did wrong, even though he's not under the Mosaic Law and he's living under the laws of the United States. He knows he did wrong. He even said himself, I'm an animal. These are things you know you do wrong by nature, is what the uh, verse is saying. And so the Mosaic Law was never given to Gentiles, made clear by Romans 2, 12 through 14. And the reason why is because Israel was a client nation in those days. So the Mosaic Law was never given to the church. Acts 15, 5. Let's look at Acts 15, 5. Mosaic Law, never given to the church. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Now this was incorrect. But some of the believers, this is part of what's been happening the whole time, Pharisees under the law, or who think they're still under the law, and they're not. Christians aren't to be under the law. And the Gentiles, and then they stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. And the reason why now they're being required to is because they never were under the law, but now the Jews say you must be, and that's not part of it. And that was cleared up in the Jerusalem Council that we've studied before. So the law of Moses is not given to Gentiles. It's not given to the church. And, uh, for example, in the church today, there are no animal sacrifices. You don't go to churches today and have animal sacrifices, but they still want to follow a bits and pieces of the law here and there. And they want you to obey Sunday as the Sabbath. Saturday is the true Sabbath in terms of the law. But every day for us is the Sabbath. So all of these things are related to covenant theology and it's come down all the way to this day and the Apostle Paul is trying to straighten everybody out and tell them, look, we're under the law of grace now. We're under the dispensation of grace. We're not under the law anymore. Stop going back to the law and stop using the law as a means of spirituality because it will not work. What is spirituality? You should be able to answer that right now. Ask yourself a question. If you can't answer this, you're in, you're in trouble. Ask it to yourself. What is spirituality? It's being filled with the Spirit. If you couldn't answer that, you're in trouble. Spirituality is being filled with the Spirit. It's not following the Mosaic Law. Spirituality today is much higher than the law. It doesn't mean believers are without law. That's insanity. We have a higher law. 
And some of the aspects of the Mosaic Law, such as divine establishment, we still follow today because our country was based on divine establishment. And actually, the Ten Commandments are divine establishment commandments. Most of them are divine establishment commandments. So the fact that they want to get rid of the Ten Commandments simply means they want to get rid of divine establishment. And that shows the, our nation going under then because uh, if the law is for anything, the law is temporary and it's for temporary freedom. And we in this country are under temporary freedom that is temporary as long as we live or as long as the nation survives. We are under freedom. That's why we have the freedom to, to assemble together. We are under divine establishment freedom, which is wonderful. But we as believers are under a higher freedom. So uh, we will see on Sunday the present purpose of the Mosaic Law, and then we will continue with Galatians and maybe even get deep into Galatians chapter 4, in which it might get a bit entertaining. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to the fact that we have a spiritual life far higher than the law. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.